This week on Crowd, we're joined by Ross Wozick and Scott Sashua, the co-founders of the Couture Club. Ross, Scott, welcome to Crowd. Thanks very much for coming in to see us and have a chat about the Couture Club. Thank you very much, welcome, mate. mate. Good to Thank see you. You too. I think probably the first place to start is, is when you started the business. You're kind of a born on social business now, aren't you? It was the Facebook page, it was the first of the Instagram page. It was the yeah, first so years, wasn't it? back in 2015, it was, well, it was actually six years last week, we officially launched a brand and that was when we, we kind of first started. But initially we just, we just had the Instagram set up. We did have a website in the making, so we were kind of working on that in the background. But we started the hype up just off Instagram and things like that before we could even get the website live. And then launched us with one t-shirt, it was in three colours at the time. And we were getting it manufactured in, in Nottingham actually, which is not even like the home of UK manufacturing, it was a bit of a random place, but it's the only place where we could get 60 t-shirts made at a time back then. So yeah, it started and then now obviously it's, it's, it's grown and it's been a big roller coaster ride. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's grown really quickly, I suppose, obviously you had quite a lot of followers on Instagram, so it made sense to make sure that you could like leverage all that you know what i think back then as well it was a lot easier because there was a lot of people just getting into instagram then but no one was really getting paid for anything so even people with big big followings would like would like the clothes and reach out to us and they'd do a post just for a free garment or something like that whereas obviously if you start a business now looking at some of the people with the same amount of following be charging thousands of pounds for the same kind of you know yeah. outreach um, so we're very lucky with that. Obviously, at the time, I'd just come off a TV show, so I had quite a really engaged audience as well. So we tried to both, obviously, make the most of that. And I kind of knew a lot of people on all the other TV shows as well. So as an initial start, that made a, a huge help to raise an awareness of the brand and obviously getting it out there. So yeah. fortunate at the time. And then the dynamic of the two, you both got really different skill sets. Didn't you study law originally? Yeah, I studied law um, and, and don't practice it at all anymore. Um, but in terms of the dynamic between us two, it's unbelievable. So I look after, I'm MD, so I look after all finances, warehousing, logistics. Um, we probably share merchandising, don't we, in terms of product ordering. Uh, and then looks, Ross looks after all the other sides, so the creative, the marketing, campaigns, influences, all that sort of stuff. So yeah. in terms of um, how we are at work, still, still yet to have our first argument. <laughs> do, do you find that you balance each other out as well? Just like having quite different personalities and skill sets, like is there one that wants to run off in a direction, the other one kind of pulls them back you in know a little what? bit? Or are you... Yes, in a way, but then also at the same time, we both kind of have the same vision, but our minds take us different ways to get there. So it's kind of, we always constantly bounce ideas off each other. And I think that's what works because I, we both value each other's opinion. So rather than kind of running too far ahead, I'll, we'll, we'll ask a question, we're like, it's kind of like a soundboard, is it a good idea? Yeah, if Scott thinks it's a good idea and I've, and I've come to him with it, vice versa, it's a good idea, so we'll go with it. Whereas I think if we're, if probably if I was left by myself, I probably would get carried away, you know, and, and I didn't have a soundboard to kind of double check things on. Yeah, so yeah. I think the, the biggest thing is, because we, cause we've grown so much, and the business got so big, we can't do everything and we realise that we can't do everything. So the fact that we trust each other implicitly, I know whatever he's doing, his side of the work is going to be done to the best of our ability and he knows the same for me. So the, the trust factor and not trying to get involved with every aspect just means that it makes it a lot easier to to work with each other because we're not like on each other's toes. I know whatever Ross is going to bring out from a clothing perspective is going to be bang on. He knows anything that I'm decision that I make financially or working with retail partners, it's going to be fine. So just having that trust between ourselves that we know that we're going to, we're pushing each other all the time to do the best that we can do within our departments. It just makes it easy, easier. Yeah. A lot and easier. then as, as you start to bring more people into the business, and obviously you guys have kind of built a culture, not just from a, an internal point of view, but from a how customers see the business. The, the culture is kind of built, and there's a definite brand image that you can see with you guys. But as you bring those extra people into the business, how how do you keep that culture going as you as you grow and expand and bring new people in? I, th I think it's a, it's a really good question. It's, it's tough, and it's something we've been working on this past year. Obviously, with the pandemic and not being in the office, you, everyone was having to work from home. And since we've come back in, we've been working really hard on that. What is our culture? What what do we stand by? And 
there's, there's a lot of different things that, that we, you can do and what we've been doing. It's one thing we probably never did in the past because in the clothing industry, everything's moving up fast, is celebrate successes. Yeah. Like, you, as soon as you've had a great day, you're on to the next. And it was kind of like things like that for the team that have been working behind the scenes. It's kind of bringing everyone in. So it's so always looking at opportunities for all the different people, like feel, push them to find opportunities for the business as well so they feel more part, celebrate success. Just unparalleled customer service really as well, like making sure that everyone from every department is offering the best they possibly can do um, for the customer. Yeah, so we both read a book at the start of the year called The Barcelona Way, which was, it, it's a book, about, it's more about football and football players and the right fit and how Zlatan didn't work at Barcelona and stuff like that. But there's a lot of, uh, for anybody listening, there's a lot of good stories on uh, within that book on what's what's good to do and what's not good to do for, for culture within the business. So we, we both read that at the start of the year and it's really helped. And then from the back of that, we set up our own culture. We put it all up over the office and people sort of buying into what we're trying to do and the, the atmosphere that we're trying to create a lot more in, t in terms of day to day. And I think what we've tried to do as well, especially with some of the more experienced longer term employees, is kind of them semi be ambassadors for the culture as well, because it's not something that we can Obviously, we can set the initial culture, but we can't force it upon people. So it's kind of, you need your key kind of ambassadors to kind of project that around the office as well as just us two kind of bombarding everyone, this is what we do, <laughs> and, and trying to boost morale that way. So the team are all on board, and I think it's probably given a lot of people, you know, a feeling of inclusivity in the business as well, and everyone's getting involved and, and supporting each other in every way they possibly can now. So it made the team a lot stronger, boosted morale, and I think everyone's probably a lot more passionate about the business and working for the business than it's just a job, what, in, what it is in a lot of other industries and, and other businesses. Do you think it comes across in the products and the way you represent yourself online and in your marketing and on the website and in stores and that as well? I, th I think that's what we try to do. Um, you'll probably be better at telling me, <laughs> <laughs> telling me that than, than I am, but it's it's what we always try and do and again with the stores as well we did a refurb on the store because we wanted to as a brand moves on kind of update the store show how the sh the stores updated like the business has and again the culture runs through the stores as well as just the head office and and the warehouse as well so Couture club we, we we played a lot with the club element of the Couture club over the over the last few years as well and we didn't want it to be like an exclusive club, like it, we want it to be an all-inclusive club rather than just an ex super, super exclusive. So we've, in terms of what we've done to, to sort of cater for that, we've tried to sort of widen our product range as we've grown. So um, increase sizing so it fits all different types of uh, body shapes, um, offer like uh, comfort clothing, nighttime clothing, fitness ranges, we're even doing kids now. So trying to make sure that that 18 to 35 year old and now even 40 young dads, 45, can, they can all shop with us just to try and create like an all in one shop that helps us grow as a business, but also helps us sort of relate to the customers too. You definitely seem to have set a trend with the oversized t-shirts. That's that definitely, you were the first ones to really do that. And I've seen a lot of larger, more known brands kind of following suit with you. So you seem to be really leading away from that, that design point of view as well. Probably more from my side, because I like a lot of baggy stuff and it's probably, initially a lot more suited and kind of probably come from the American streetwear yeah. um, style because they are, everything is relaxed, everything is kind of oversized. And in the UK, you, there's like a certain culture that's like that. And then there's, there's obviously areas where people dress smarter and things like that. So it's not for everyone, but obviously that's why we try and obviously we have our oversized, our regular fit and our slim fit stuff. So we try and cover all bases with it, but with a lot of the trend stuff and, some of the more out there styles, yeah, they tend to be the, the more oversized stuff. Yeah. The last 12 months have been pretty difficult for a lot of businesses, for retail in general. It's been pretty difficult to kind of understand what's going to open, if it's going to open, when it's going to open. But obviously online has been the thing that's kept on, kept on going. And you guys were in a fortunate position that the bulk of your business is online. You had your distribution network set up. Some of the retailers that I work with ran into problems because those stores were the distribution points. Yeah. Um, so even though they had an online shop, they couldn't actually dispatch anything. So you guys did quite well, but not only that, the style of clothing that you do, 
yeah. kind of fit into that everyone working from home wearing more chilled clothes I think this is like one of the first times I've not had elastic <laughs> 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 waistbands on yeah. quite a while it's um, but yeah it, it did kind of play into things has, has that really helped the growth of the we, business we actually um, we actually two weeks before lockdown was announced we, we launched our first loungewear range um, and the first two weeks, two weeks sales were okay but then as soon as lockdown hit it just sold out very very quickly we, we, were, we were quite tentative at the start of lockdown because nobody knew what was going to happen. We didn't know furlough was going to be a thing. We didn't know people would be supported so, so well from the government, et cetera, et cetera. So all working from home, the sort of, sort of clothing was, was more in line with what we were selling. So we actually sat down and we reforecasted. We cut a lot of our costs out um, in terms of like marketing and, and um, consultants that we'd worked with, et cetera, et cetera. And we just sort of said, let's look at this from a worst case scenario perspective um, and, and there was a really bad two week lull where you know I think industry wide people had a couple of really bad weeks and then after two weeks sales just skyrocketed um, for, for, for most people in online business but we did really really well out of it unfortunately lost both our stores which is it's quite a lot of revenue but not as big as our online has ever been um, and now we're just seeing the other side to that. So now we're seeing that April 12th, the world's reopened again. People spending habits are changing again. People's shop, shopping habits in terms of what they want to buy is changing again. So it's just, you've just got to adapt so quickly. So tracksuits are not the number one thing that are selling at the moment. We need to get more denim, more, more nighttime sort of products in. And people's spending habits have even changed because for the last 12 months, all they've been able to do is buy clothing online. Now they can go to restaurants again, they can go on holiday again, they can go to the pub again. So um, the, the, the physical money that they've got you know, to spend on a monthly basis it isn't just all being spent on clothing. I guess, so. I guess nighttime work is going to be coming back. I mean, I've, I've been out in Manchester quite a lot the every last night, couple yeah. of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and it's busy every night, everywhere. Like You can't get a restaurant booking. I mean... Trying to get in the ivy or somewhere like that, you, you're booking tables weeks in advance, aren't you? It's just... Um... I think that's it. I think there's, like Scott mentioned there, things have totally changed the opposite way now. Whereas there was pretty much zero distraction. It was kind of shopping out of boredom just to take a picture because people were that bored at home and wanted to feel good about being sat at home every single day. Whereas now it's gone from that to there have been so many distractions that everyone's like, oh, I'm not even, not even bothered. I bought loads of clothes and barely wore them last year, so I might as well just wear them for a bit. So... Again, it's just all about adapting, isn't it? Like we were touched on last year. I think at the initial start of lockdown, there, were, there was talks of them even shutting warehouses and things like that. And if that had happened, do you know what I mean? It could have been an absolutely terrible year. Luckily for everyone in the industry and, and stuff, the mail services still ran as fine and warehouses were allowed to stay open. So that's when we were reforecasting that, you, you had to look at, you know, worst case scenario and really do everything you can. And we look back at it now and you think, you know what, imagine what it would have been like if we kept our marketing budget at what it was. We could have you know I mean, done some serious numbers. And I know a lot of people did do that, but we tried to run the cleanest, you know, like the best business we could at the time. And I'm super happy with how we performed last year, I think. Sometimes doubling down when everyone else bottles it, it's not a, not a bad Scott strategy, is it? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've noticed you do it before, though, when, like, at a, at a quiet time here, you guys are like out there with email messaging and Facebook yeah. ads and Instagram ads and stuff. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's like what we spoke about briefly before offline. Was it's it's, it's having the physical. Like most of the marketing things that we do now, we can turn on and off overnight. So when we see do see a shift in pattern, a shift in habits, it, it, you know, it's the right time to spend. We, we will always do that definitely. In my day job at Red Eye, we've seen about a ninety percent increase in online. It looks like it's going to stay. Even now, shops are open and people can spend money elsewhere. It seems that. People have got quite used to that online ordering and things. Be, the convenience of things being delivered to the door. The fact they can order a couple of sizes and send the ones back that, that don't necessarily fit. Are you, is, are you seeing that the same sort of trend that things will actually go a little more online but the store side of things will still come back anywhere? Possibly, yeah. I think the whole, the numbers there, I don't know what demographic they're over, but as a younger consumer, which I'd probably say our customer is, like Scott mentioned, 18 to 35, they're probably quite already invested in online shopping it's a lot of the say for example like my parents they were never really that big on you know amazon and things like that and then now they're like they're blown away by this whole thing that they didn't even know about whereas for the clothing industry it's already already been very dominant online so obviously we'll see the increase and i do think it will stay there but um 
We're quite lucky though, because we, 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 obviously with the stores, we get to see how people's shopping habits are in both sets of, sets of the world. So the people that shop online, the people that shop in the store. And in the same breath as what we're also saying that the 18 to 35 year olds, um, you know, they're tech savvy and they'll shop online. They've probably got accounts everywhere. They're also the ones that probably scared the least about getting caught yeah. with COVID. So they're the ones that are also the busiest people in the shopping mall. So the only way that we can take a read of it is we opened up uh, Trafford Centre again on April the 12th and we, we were doing the same figures if not a lot a lot higher than we did two years ago pre-COVID and we only forecast to do like 80% down back on two years ago based on we thought it'd be a lot more people like tentative so the shops have opened and opened up quite well but again I don't know whether that might be a three month thing because people have been missing out on it for so long and then they'll just naturally move back to the online. And I think as well especially with the stores how you look at it now as well is your conversion rate is different to what it used to be because yeah. If you're going to a shopping centre now and you're going to a store to purchase and there is a risk, you know, like, like in the world now, there's a, there's a risk you might catch something. They're going there to buy rather than going there to just look. Crowds. Yeah, yeah, people are going for a walk in the countryside if they're going for a walk instead of the yeah. traffic centre, aren't they? Even, yeah. if it, even if it's raining. So it's like, whereas before people would kind of just be in traffic centre for something to do, I'd probably say, even though there's nowhere near the same amount of footfall in the centre as a total right now, your conversion's through the roof because the people that are there are going with a, with a meaning to buy something, so... There's a lot more intention about yeah. it. Yeah. The yeah. other thing I've noticed, like being in, being in Manchester City Centre during the day, there's very few people compared to what they used to be rushing about at lunch times and early in the day. I mean, I wouldn't want to own Costa Coffee or Pret or anywhere like the sort of lunchtime places and coffee yeah. places. Yeah. But that footfall doesn't seem to be there like it used to be. Like you said, people going having a browse around, so you've still got to get your products in front of people. So does that kind of bring that online and marketing piece, does that make that even more important going forward? And then that in-store part, it's, it's an experience, isn't it? Yeah. People do want to go to the shop, try things on, yeah. and that kind of becomes more of an experience outing kind of day than yeah. than people just sort of being in town or at work. They've got a bit of time to call in the lunch room. Before yeah, and I think trail. even like all, all out of home media for the last 12 months was just a no-go because there's nobody on the street. So whereas previously we'd done like football stadiums, we'd done digital billboards, taxis, that kind of market. And you just switch it to where people, the, the most eyes are going to be. So whether that's YouTube, whether it's um, Facebook, Google ads, you know, Daily Mail articles or whatever it might be. It's just just, just changing your pot from, from, one, from, from one pot to another, literally. It's like having a plan and just being slightly more flexible with it, I suppose, isn't it? You've got to adapt to, to where the customer is. And, and I think the whole industry now, it is, as every year, there's more and more brands that start. It's a very saturated industry, so you've, you have got to work hard to get the same amount of revenue now as probably what you might have done years ago. You know, it's like, I hear from everyone, the cost per clicks are through the roof at certain times, and, and it is a battle to... to to get in front of people. Yeah, that, that's going to get worse, isn't it, later in the year with the cookie legislation that's coming yeah. in. So that owning a database of your own customers that, I mean, I'm, I'm on your mail list, I get at the emails from you guys and engage with them. But if you don't have that, that's going to get really bloody expensive, isn't it, going I, forward? I think we're, we're very aware of, there's obviously, there was obviously the Facebook phenomenon like in the last few years of how many how successful people are doing with Facebook ads and stuff like that. And it was, You've always always had that doubt, like it's, it's kind of too good to be true. Like at some point it's going to end, and obviously that, hooked. and that's kind of <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of happened now. So we, in the background for the last few years, have been working really hard on our like loyalty scheme. Um, I've, do you know what I mean, building basically the segments inside our business as well, so that we can really support our own customers and using our own data. So you, you know, self-sufficient in a way course obviously you need to bring in obviously a lot of the new customers but it's kind of how you look after the ones you've got as well yeah. and, and there's no point returning. having those massive acquisition programs if you're not returning the customers and if you're not and if you're not treating the customer right um, we've adapted a lot of things in our business with like all different types of like free returns everything like that doing everything we possibly can to support the customer because your, your business is only as good as your customer base really isn't it yeah. And I think one of the things, I know I, I definitely fall for it all the time, where you get free delivery over a certain amount, that pushing that average order value up. There's like, there's little things that you can tweak, but like within that customer experience that works really well. But it seems that 
the channels that you communicate with people to retain customers are just going to get more and more important as time goes on. I mean, you've, you've, you've massively booked the trend in a really competitive space. I mean, you look at some of the big players that have gone bust because they've not used influencer marketing right. They've not had a decent online presence. They're not slick when it comes to deliveries and the time it takes and returns and that kind of thing. But the things that you've got right, the customer experience that you've given, what what more can you do? What what's, what are the plans for growth? Because obviously you've doubled and doubled and doubled and I know you've got plans for the next couple of years to keep kind of doubling the size of the business. Um, what's What are the next steps to keep that momentum going as well as customer experience? Yeah, customer experience is a massive one. We just touched on all the points um, that we can do there. The, the, biggest, the biggest thing for us um, to, to sort of help us enable us to grow are number one, traffic to the site. So making sure that influencer marketing, I think collabs will be a big thing for us moving forward. So whether that's with a music artist or, a, um, I don't know, a blogger or an influencer of some sort, um, I think that's one way that other companies have grown quite quickly and, and it's quite aggressive route to market. Uh, it, it expanding our, um, our clothing base. So we launched activewear this year. Um, Again, sustainable basics, sustainability is going to be huge over the next few years. So I think making sure that we're staying relevant product wise and appealing to new people, new audiences, together with collabs. We just did a, co a collab with Alessi, um, which is probably a lot more of a uh, less formal sort of brand to us, but with a huge, huge audience, 30 year heritage, uh, massive in international territories where we're not and, and sort of things like that, where we can lean on their audience. We're a lot bigger in the UK th than they are admittedly, which is why we've got the collab and they wanted to appeal to a, a younger caller audience in the UK. So just doing things like that, that are going to make sure, you know, we scratch your back um, and I scratch yours and it just makes it, it makes it super relevant for everybody. Yeah. Sharing audience is a really smart thing to do though, isn't it? Whether it's with influencers or other businesses that you can do yeah, the collabs with. It, you're helping each other grow in every way, but it's also, you've got to find the right relevancy there. I feel like it's super important on who it is. Yeah. Um, um, what you want out of it. I think you could quite easily commit to a million collaborations and it might not be suited. So it's it, the main thing really is how, how super relevant it is for the brand and what the, the aim to get out of it is. But once they're in place, um, then it should work perfectly. But again, for us, it's, it's like Scott said, there's a lot of new territories to go at. We, we've seen a lot of organic growth in Europe. And then this year, especially since Brexit, a lot of organic growth in the US. And that was, always something like which was a huge dream for us but kind of more long term like you, you know how much financial it's going to need to, to really give it a push but for us to already see like such rapid organic growth there it's only given us a confidence so that when we do turn the budgets on and really start focusing on the US and things like that we should be able to get an amazing reaction there as well so it's, it's the new customer base and also making sure that every single customer that buys from you now keeps repeating by looking after them with the loyalty scheme double point stays next day delivery we're we're trying to work on our delivery trying to get as late as possible delivery you know like the world's spoiled now with huge corporations like asos and things doing next day delivery well amazon next day delivery you can order up until 12 o'clock and it's on you same day with some yeah, yeah same day cities, so yeah. I think we'll be working for the rest of the year on, on offering same day in certain cities, um, next day delivery up until 10 p.m., which is, we're currently up to 7 p.m., which for us, for what I'd still class as a small business in the grand scheme of things, it, it's as good as we can do right now, but we're working behind the scenes to do everything so that that becomes 10 o'clock and then that becomes later on. And like you said, the same day deliveries in, in key cities is, is um, the next thing for us, but it's just, offering the customer the best possible service we can with the best products and keeping the quality exactly how it is. Yeah. You sort of touched on one thing, that the sustainability thing keeps coming up in conversations I'm having with clients and lots of articles that I've read. Um, I was listening to with a chat from Unilever the other week saying that the brands that they've got that are brands with purpose and it's usually around some kind of cause, often environmental, are the ones that are doing 70% of Unilever's growth. Are you starting to feel that's coming through from messaging that you get from customers that, that sustainable supply chains are becoming more and more important? And from a lot younger audience than you'd think. So we, we did market research around 12 months ago with a, with a student audience around um, a student programme that we were, we were going to run and sustainability, whether it was the clothing, the packaging, um, anything that, that we could get our hands on that sustainable was a massive must for like 18 to 21 year olds and that was a massive surprise to me because I was like 
when I was 18, 21, to be honest with you, I wouldn't have been that bothered. Um, we then fast forward six months and we, we launched with uh, a, a huge German retailer called Zalando. And to get onto Zalando, you've got to show that you've got 20% of your product base is sustainable. Um, and then there's huge brands that have come in like Pangea and, 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 and brands like that that are, are purely sustainable. So I think for us, um, we, were, we were quite quick to do it in the, in the sense of what we did, but there's going to be a lot more growth from, from us in terms of what we can offer from a sustainable basics or sustainable active wear collection. And I think because it's become, there's so much more awareness around it now, it will become easier to manufacture. We can do a lot more for the customer on it. I think initially it was super expensive. It was super hard to get the quality you'd want. Whereas now, because it is becoming such a huge thing, a lot of factories are, uh, it's becoming a lot easier to do it. So eventually I think we'll end up moving our whole, whole business into some form of sustainable um, like Scott mentioned, we've got our sustainable range is 100% recyclable as well, so it's like the full works rather than a lot of brands just do organic cotton. So we, we really want it to be fully recycled and the best we could do. So we spent a lot of time developing that, but we just got to like, keep growing it across the business as well now. Awesome stuff. I think, to be fair, with the rate that you guys have grown, that's going to going to carry on going. But I think other things are sort of growing in your personal lives, aren't you? <laughs> Scott's just had a child. You've got your first one coming. Have you been giving him loads of advice on... To on be fair, to that he came round to my house last week and played dead for 20 minutes with my, with my oldest child. So I was like, getting the good practice in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be any minute now, to be fair. I should, I should, I should probably check my phone. <laughs> um, no, I'm excited. It's, it's a new challenge, but I think from seeing what Scott was like the first time round, it just gives you more of a drive, more of, more passion, more of a reason to work even harder than you already are. Yeah. Um, of course, there's going to be that home life, work life juggle yeah. and, um, and balancing it the right way. But at the same time, you've, you've got even more of a purpose you know to, to be more successful and make the business more successful cool well good luck congrats <laughs> thanks very much for coming in really appreciate it guys thank you very much thank, thank you time. thanks a lot and we'll see you again on the next episode of crowd